Hi, my name is Colleen McGettigan, and I'm doing my mind map. My central image is building blocks with question marks. The reason why I chose that image is because I see that real reading has been built on bits and pieces of many scholars' research and findings throughout history, and we still have so many questions about it. After viewing the PowerPoints, I had questions, so I did a little research, and I went back as far as like the 1600s. I found so much, but I kind of broke it down into what I thought were like major contributors to education. I just have a little arm for that. Um, I found somebody named John Locke. He wrote some thoughts on education, which focused on educating the upper class boys to make them moral, rationally thinking young gentlemen. So I chose, I put his book there, and I chose to put the little boy because education was really for, you know, the wealthier boys of the world. Women didn't really get educated way back then. Um, then there was Wolf. Wolf did some research on the mind, and he said that the mind was best developed through mental discipline, and he believed that we needed to do basic skills first, and then we could do the abstract, which we see that later on too by some more researchers. Um, I put the little face there because with the straight line for mental discipline. Um, in 1783 we had Webster. He was dissatisfied with the English text and wrote three volumes uh, called A Grammatical Institute of English. Um, one was spelling, one was grammar, and one was reading. The spelling one is still in print. In the 1800s, I put um, the wheelchair, the little girl, and the ABCs because that was kind of like the age of disabilities. It seems to be the time where we began to realize value, the value in educating everyone, with even people with various handicaps. Um, girls started getting their own schools and started going to school. We were making schools of the blind, deaf, developmental schools. We even had our first kindergarten in the 1800s. Um, Darwin's theory of evolution sets the stage, in the 1800s, sets the stage for all the controversy following that. Should we teach it? Should we not teach it? Um, also, at this time, Horace Mann began his mission for free public schools and training for teachers. Um, and some important organizations were developed in the 1800s. Never I never realized how far back these, uh, these things went. Um, the National Teachers Association, and the Department of Ed. Okay, so that finishes that. Now, the early 1900s were a groundbreaking time. There was a lot of research being done in reading, and we had Thorndike. He believed oral silent reading has a place. Reading is thinking, therefore we can make meaning of the text, kind of like a formula in math. Gray and Judd believed oral expression helped, uh, believed silent reading was more practical. Then Parker was the one that believed oral expression helped independent reading. And if you see, I have the closed mouth and the open mouth for them, the, the closed mouth for their silent reading. And Parker's the one that he wanted them to talk about it, which I thought was very important because we need to talk about our reading and think through it. Um, then I put Thorndike's little theory where he says, you know, reading a sentence in a paragraph is like solving a math problem. And it, it kind of is. So I thought that was important. This is also the time of Piaget's child conception of the world introduced a theory of cognitive development that suggests children move through four stages of mental development, from the concrete to the abstract, which makes sense. And that's, you know, how we other people would develop their questions over time depending on how old the kids were and things like that. Also during this time the first SAT was administered and it, the SAT was based on the Army Alpha Test so I put a little flag there as that image. Okay, the 1930s and the 1940s. Boy. Sorry, got a lot going on here. My paper. Okay.
There we go. I couldn't start over. I've done this 10 times already. <laughs> Um, in the 1930s and 40s, um, Rosenblatt's transactional theory, um, it was, he thought that reading was a transaction between the reader and the text. She did. She voiced that theory that all people don't interpret text the same way because they bring different background knowledge, which is why I put the two faces with the book in the middle. I thought that would pretty much sum that up, and it's so true. Um... That's, this is the, also the time where basal readers came out, uh, teachers holding the manual, because that's kind of like our first, technically our first teaching manual with workbooks and text and things like that. Um, in the 1940s and the 1950s, Dick and Jane, there they are in the circle. And I put them in that circle because that's when round-robin reading came really big with predictable text. Um, I thought that was kind of a step back because we had started the, in the early 1900s, you know, Thorndike, Gray, Judd, and Parker, they kind of thought, you know, silent reading had its place, and then the round-robin reading takes that away. Um, I, put, uh, I, I put the little foot with the arrow back, showing that I feel that's a step back. Um, World War II, during that time period, as that ended... Um, you know, education got, before it ended, education got put on the back burner, but, um, FDR, after it was over, passed the GI Bill, and when he passed that GI Bill, colleges were flooded, because that ends the previous tradition that colleges for the wealthy, and enrollment nearly doubled, and it was great, because people were getting educated, but they weren't really prepared for it. That brings us to the 1950s. Bloom's taxonomy. Um, changes in reading research start to improve. Um, they get even more in depth. We have Bloom's taxonomy, which divides six cognitive domains and is still used by curriculum researchers and teachers today. He, uh, that's kind of like the higher order thinking skills. Um, they were like stairs to thought. They go from you know, lower level to higher level. Uh, Flesh brought back phonetics. He thought sounds, um, you should learn your sounds and then your blends instead of memorizing sight words. Um, and you need to do it while you were writing, which I thought was neat. I put the, um, the little beaker, the math, and the words there because, um, partially because of Sputnik, science, math, and foreign language became important again. So the National Defense Education Act provided funding for them, and we started paying more attention to math and science, which I think is funny because now we're starting back with the STEM education and everything. Okay, the 1960s. This is where writing got big. That's a pencil and paper to show that. Um, we also started with very specific reading strategies to zero in on the people who were struggling. We needed some thinking strategies, so SQ3R and DRA became big. This is also when Cole promoted the open classroom. Um, that's when they feel student-centered classrooms and holistic learning will benefit the children. Goodman came up with the MISQ analysis, which is great. We still use this today. Um, in teaching because you want to make sure that children are making meaning, semantic, syntactic, and graphophonic, the grammar, the sounds, and the meaning. And you can plan your instruction from there. Uh, Chaw tried to end the big debate on reading because it's just ongoing, as you can see. She kind of, I'm not sure if it's a man or a woman, but... <laughs> Um, they said reading should include comprehension, word knowledge, have some silent reading, um, that you should learn 50 to 100 sight words, and then begin phonics. And in, with phonics is not only sounds, but context clues and picture clues, which I like that about. I didn't know that about Chaw. Um, phonics should be ongoing and not isolated. It should be embedded in the text. So some really great stuff out of that research. Um, and that reading instruction will occur when the kids are ready. 
So you should also do small groups. That was kind of one of the beginnings to small groups. Okay, that brings us to the 1970s and 1980s. Okay, so 1970 was kind of like the pedagogy of a press, which I learned about this, and um, there's so much more to learn that I, I definitely plan to look into it. But it was kind of, we were trying to stop inequalities, social inequalities. Um, we were trying to understand the differences and address them between people and examine the relationships between the students and the teachers. Um, you know, sometimes it's just... You know, they're just totally different with everything that was going on. I think there was a lot of different teaching going on depending on where you were. Um, this is also the time of whole language. And I kind of put that little circle there because it was sort of a balanced approach, not completely balanced, which we get to later. Um, it was an, it, they it called for oral language rich literature, thematic type learning, and it was very child-centered, but mostly large group. So, you know, that was a portion of what we needed, but we know we need some more things than that. Um, then become the handicap, the uh, wheelchair is because the federal law was passed that all students, no matter what their disability, have a right to free and appropriate public education, which we know created a lot of jobs. Um, and then there, the book Why Johnny Can't Write, that comes back, the reading debate, it heats it up, so I put a little flame under there. Um, you know, they were finding people were struggling, so that brought the reading debate back open. Uh, 1980 to 1990, this is a red flag time period. Um, Carter signs the Refugee Act and the Mariel Boatlift, and that brings lots of people over from Cuba, um, people coming up from Mexico, and it, they just flood the schools with um, ELL students, and we weren't prepared for that. So we were kind of deemed a nation at risk. Um, and educational reform, you know, that's, it's a big time period for that. Um, Cunningham introduced balanced literacy, which combined whole language and phonics and added in some more small group and centers. And this is also when Madeline Hunter introduced her direct instruction teaching model, which we also benefited from. This brings us to the 1990s. Okay, this is when pretty much Cunningham wins the war on the balanced approach, which is why I have my little balance beam. Um, you know, she wins. All There's all different ways that kids can learn, so we need to hit all of those ways. Um, we also have Adam's book, Beginning to Read, Thinking, learn, thinking About Learning About Print, um, it burned back the phono phonological awareness, which also we needed in the balanced literacy. Um, I think, is that it? Yes. Okay, so we have uh, literacy more is more than just reading. We realize this now. It's the writing. It's the vocabulary. It's the word study. Um, we really need to focus on all of these things, and this is where... Um, the National Reading Panel decides that they need to test, assess the effectiveness of our reading instruction. So we have some conclusions from that report. Phonemic awareness, phonics, guided repeated oral reading, um, vocabulary, making meaning, it's not just decoding. Also, I put this little teacher here because this is the age of professional development. You know, we started having to do our 100 hours and, you know, teachers are being held more accountable. Um, this is also No Child Left Behind, Bush's Reform, plans to hold teachers accountable. So the problem with that was that for all these years we've been making these accommodations for people and now they're being held to the same test and they're just not at the same level. So now we need to fix that, which comes to David Coleman's Common Core Standards. He knows the importance of compacting the curriculum 
uh, we were all over the place for a while there. Um, we would just be trying to cover too much. So they compacted the curriculum, gave us more of a focus. Uh, it may seem like more. I believe that it isn't more. We just need to do things more effectively. And we need to raise the bar. We absolutely need to raise the bar. Um, we need to think more closely at the continuum. And what we're trying to do is prepare kids that are college and career ready. I believe in it. I, I think that it's going to work if we educate teachers and you know continue on with this building the blocks of reading education in the United States. Thank you.